How's everybody doing? Great to see you. Last week, I was in uh, New York City for a seminar, conference kind of thing. And um, what we did was uh, we booked uh, our hotel room in the same hotel that the conference was going to be in. So we would just be able to sleep, wake up, get ready, and then just go downstairs to where the conference was and not have to travel in any way because so we, we weren't uh, going to rent a car because that's like uh, not a wise thing to do in New York City. And uh, so we're fl- Mar- as I was with Pastor Mark, and we're flying there, and uh, there's a church that we really like in New York, and they have a midweek service. And we said, hey, you know, we're going to land in New York not uh, right around the time that the service is starting. So what if instead of taking a cab to the hotel, we took a cab to where their church service was? So we decided that. So we landed, we got out to the curb, and we said, hey, you know, take us down to this place down by Madison Square Garden. And because uh, we're like church nerds in that way. Uh, so we just went straight to the, uh, the church service. So we walked into the service and I got my backpack with my iPad and I've got my carry on. I just stro- roll it in because, you know, most people bring luggage to a church service. Um, and we, it was great service and we, had, we were so glad that we were there. Uh, ran into a buddy of mine who was also there. Weird, weird thing. And... Um, so after the, service, after the service, we get out, and uh, we're staying in Rockefeller Center, or right next to Rockefeller Center, and, um, and uh, so it, we're having trouble hailing a cab, so we just say, hey, it's a few blocks, let's just walk. So we walk from about Madison Square Garden to, um, to Rockefeller Center, which is probably a mile or two, and then we finally get to the hotel. By this time, the service had let out, it was probably almost 10, and then... Um, you know, it was, I was totally ill-equipped for the fact that it was like 35 degrees now. I had this like thin jacket on. My head was freezing. So I actually had stopped in this. Um, I, it was a weird thing. You know, I, I bought this ski cap that said New York on it, uh, which was very difficult as someone from Boston uh, to just buy something with New York. So anyway, afterwards, I took it and I burned it in Jesus' name. Um, no, I didn't do that. Uh, but uh, I did tell my wife, and I'm like, hey, just, I'm never going to wear that again. So, you know, you don't even have to wash it. Um, so anyway, so we finally get to the hotel, and that's when we got the bad news. They told us that there had been some water damage, and we weren't going to be able to stay in the hotel that night. And, but they said, uh, and I said, so what are you going to do? They said, well, we have a, a sister hotel that's just two doors down. I'm like, oh, that's fine. We'll stay there. They said, but that's all sold out. And I'm like, well, why did you even bring that up? If, anyway, so, th- but they said, but we have a sister hotel that's off Wall Street in the financial district. And I'm like, yeah, but that's probably like, what, 25 minutes away? And we're, we're, doing, we're part of a, a seminar here in this hotel. And they said, yeah, but, um, you know, we don't have any other options. So, you know, between 25 minutes away or sleeping on the street, I chose 25 minutes away. And uh, so we get there. <clears throat> now, the hotel that we were staying at was pretty nice, and we got a great rate because of this conference that we were going to be at. And there's a, you know, they get a group rate. They drop the price considerably. But it, you wouldn't even think that the hotel we were going to stay at and the one we ended up staying at were at all related and part of the same company. Because we walk in, and they give us the room. And I forget what it is, like 2101 or something is our number. We get up to the top, and I remember opening the door, and I was like, you got to be kidding me. Mark walks in and just says, whoa. And it was just like a hotel room, only smaller. Uh, and, and, you know, there was like, we walk in and there's single beds. Like I hadn't seen a, a, not like a double, two double beds. It was two single beds. Like I hadn't seen that, I don't know, since I was like eight, you know, like a single bed. And then uh, I said, you know, Mark, let me try this. And I put one hand on one wall, and I was almost able to touch the other wall. And I, I'm like, this is like a converted broom closet that they've turned into a room. And I, I, I called downstairs, and, uh, and I said, this is like unacceptable. Uh, you got to get us another room that's a little bigger than this because, um, you know, this is like really small. And they're like, sir, that's all we've got. So if, if, you, if you want, you can cancel your reservation and, you know, try to walk around and find something. Well, by the time we had left that church service, walked to Rockefeller Center, I had, you know, argued kindly with the person there, then taken the thing. It was like almost one o'clock in the morning, uh, or it was probably about 1230 or so, and we were just beat. Uh, and we had to be, this thing started at 8 a.m. The next, that day, so we're thinking, you know, we, we, we need to just kind of stop um, fighting now, you know, trying to make it work. And so I said, all right, fine. So I, I hung up and and then, you know, you kind of get into a room and you're kind of walking around looking at it. 
Uh, well, where's the closet? Well, there wasn't one. Uh, and then you, you open the door. Now, this is going to sound a little, this might be a little crass, and so can you just forgive me if it's a little bit crass for you? Um, but, you know, we're friends, right? I mean, some of us have known each other for like 10 minutes already, okay? And uh, so, but you can just, can I get like an umbrella of mercy for a moment? Uh, because I'm not trying to needlessly be crass, but um, I opened the door to the bathroom, and um, the, just, you know, I'm checking it out, and it was, and I'm like, I don't know how, so I'm telling Mark, I'm like, I don't know how people, it, does anyone actually use this? Because it was just like this, it, you know, it was a really small bathroom, and um, the toilet was so close to the wall that if anyone, I'm not saying you would, but if there was a person who actually had to use that, they wouldn't be able to kind of sit on it straight up. They'd have to kind of sit on it sideways to make it work because it was so close to the wall. And I'm like, this is just a bad, you know, I'm like, who, what, what architect, like, said this is the way to do it, you know? Um, and and it, was, it was just really a, a bad um, situation. And, uh, and <laughs> so the other thing was is that we didn't eat before we left Miami because, you know, New York City, if, they have, if there's anything that New York City has going for it, it's like a million great restaurants. And so when we weren't able to um, get to the restaurant we wanted to, it's like, man, it's getting late. Let's just go to the hotel. They have a restaurant there. Then we weren't able to, to stay at that hotel. They sent us to the other hotel. I say, is there a restaurant there? Oh, there's a great restaurant there at the hotel. And I say, well, is it, um, is it open? Because, you know, it's like almost midnight. And they're like, oh, yeah, they're open late. Well, I get there, of course. They're closed. And... Um, and so I ended up eating at a restaurant I had never eaten before, which is, uh, it's a very fine uh, dining restaurant. It's called Third Floor Vending Machine. Uh, I don't know if you've ever eaten that. Woo, it's such a great variety. You know, uh, it was like Twizzlers, pretzels, and, uh, and like Fritos. That was pretty much um, it. And, um, and here's the thing is that, and by the way, you know, all, like you would think that I would know better because of all the crazy things that happened to me. And I know that all the crazy things happen to me is because you guys like hearing the stories that I tell about the crazy things. So I want you to know that whenever something like this crazy happens to me, I think of you and I blame all of you for it. So I just, I figured I'd tell you that. Um, now, here's the weird part of the whole story is that in, at the church service I was at, um, it was just, it was ama an amazing service that we were part of. And the pastor was teaching on the fact that all we need is Jesus. You can go through trials, difficulties, tough circumstances. All we need is him. We need to trust him, cling to him. And, uh, man, we were worshiping, engaging. Um, and, and I walked out the door, and I couldn't make the connection between what was said in the church service and what was happening in my life 15 minutes after the, after the service had let out. And it was a weird thing. And it's like, it's obvious that God is trying to show me something with all this crazy stuff happening. And then... But what's amazing is um, he's trying to show me something. Hey, remember that, that, that message you heard that you were really agreeing with, taking notes on, and then you were going to share some of it, so, and, but you weren't going to give credit, right? Remember that? Yeah? Um, because pastors don't do that. Um, you know, um, if you only copy one person, it's plagiarism. If it's two or more, that's research. Um, uh, so, <laughs> um, so anyway, I, so I, I'm, I'm, you know, but the thing that happens, He's telling me, I'm th like, God, you know, I'm hearing this, I'm receiving it, but I walk out the door of the church, and I wasn't able to make the connection between what was said from a stage and real life. And this is the thing that I think happens all the time. God is at work in us, and we miss it. We could be in a church service, walk out, and miss it, because our spiritual antenna aren't up. And all the noise of this life is drowning out our ability to hear him and see what it is that God is doing. And listen to what the Bible says in, in, in uh, Philippians 2. It says that for God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And so God is at work. He's using everything possible to work in you and through you. But we need to be wise. We need to see the work that God is doing. Because here's the thing. If we can be open to the work he's doing, and if we can celebrate the work that he's doing, we can actually be changed by the work that he's doing. You see, <clears throat> two weeks ago we started this series that uh, is called Magnificat. And uh, we were, we're looking at Mary's song. When Mary finds out, when she's told that she's going to give birth to the Messiah, the King of Israel, that this, this amazing 
uh, opportunity that she's been given, this amazing privilege that she's been given, she just breaks out into song. And uh, in Latin, uh, it's the first word of the song is magnificat, and so theologians call it by its Latin name, uh, the first word, my soul magnifies the Lord. So it's called magnificat in Latin. And also we call it magnificat because at Calvary, we're high culture. And so that's why, because we're high culture, we call things by Latin terms. We speak to each other in Latin and other ancient languages. Um, and so, but here's the thing. Now, make no mistake. This is no lightweight song. The lyrics in this song are as theologically deep as it gets. In fact, in the nine or ten verses that uh, constitute this song, there's more than 12 references to the Old Testament, allusions and direct quotations. And I want you to notice the flow of the song because we're kind of in the middle of it. And so for those of you that maybe it's your first time here or you haven't been here in a while and you're like, man, what is this? What, how's the song go? Um, she opens and says, my soul magnifies the Lord uh, because of what God is doing in her life. And then she goes on and she talks about who God is. And she's like, you know, God has done this and God has done this and God has done this. And it's an amazing thing that God is because God is this, God is this. And it's like, she says, God has done amazing things, and then God has done a great work. God has done a great work, um, it, you know, because this is, this is who he is. And so there's this, uh, she's explaining who God is, but then she moves on to talk about that not just God has done wonderful things in her life, and that God is amazing, but then that God is at work in the world. God is at work throughout history, showing us some things about what it is that that, that's happening, and what happens is while God is at work, we can miss it. And so what Mary does is she makes three statements in these two verses we're going to look at in her song. And I believe this is so important for us, because here's what can happen. God is at work, and if we don't have our antenna up to see the work happening, we can start to believe that God has forgotten. And when we start to believe that, that maybe God has forgotten or God ha isn't working as fast as we had hoped, we begin to take matters into our own hands. And when we do that, this song, what it does is it reminds us that God is working, even when we don't see it, even when we don't see the desired outcome as quickly as we had hoped that it, that it would happen, God is still at work, and he's going to bring a glorious resolution to what it is that's taking place. So I'm going to invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. That's where we're going to be um, this morning. And uh, if you, so if you open your Bible there, if you don't, uh, maybe you have your smartphone or your iPhone or iPad, if you'd open that, um, or you have one of those Samsung phones that are the size of an iPad, but they're actually a phone that's like the biggest phone I've ever seen. It's like the size of a shoe, um, but no judgment from me, no judgment from me. Um, anyway, just making conversation as you open. Um, so here's, uh, here's what we start in verse 51. It says, He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. Now, if you pause there and give me your attention, what I want to do in these two verses is simply show you three ways that God is at work in our lives. And through the song of Mary, and here's the first one if you're taking notes, and that is that God has revealed his power. He's revealed his power. The first thing that she says uh, in, these, in these verses is that he has shown, God has shown strength with his arm. And this is actually a phrase that's used throughout the Old Testament, this idea of the arm of the Lord. That the arm of the Lord is a common phrase that speaks of God's reach and God's care for his people. That it's, uh, it is his arm that reached down and helped his people in times of need. Now this language of the arm of the Lord, that at this particular time that he's helped his people, this is not just um, casual language that she's using, but instead this is language that speaks of the Exodus. And so this is where God's people were slaves in Egypt, and God rescued them and brought them to the land of promise. In fact, here's what God would say as, as they left Egypt. In Deuteronomy 5, it says, And remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. You see, there's, uh, there are parallels between Israel's situation when they were slaves in Egypt and Israel's situation in Mary's day. 
so similar that we, you just go back and forth and you realize, wow, there, there's something that Mary's trying to connect between what happened then and what's happening now in, in her reality. Um, in both times, in the time of the Exodus and in Mary's day, both were, uh, Israel at both times was being oppressed by a foreign nation. Uh, it was Egypt in the time of the Exodus. It was Rome in the time of Mary. Um, in both times, Israel had been oppressed for hundreds of years. Uh, in the time of the Exodus, it was 400 years of slavery in Egypt. In this time, in Mary's day, it had been 400 years since God had spoken. The final prophecies of the Old Testament had been given, and now there was 400 years of silence. After, <coughs> pardon me, the last prophecies were given in Malachi, which we'll be studying in January and February, um, that there was, that God promised that he would send the Messiah, but then there were 400 years of silence saying, God, have you, have you forgotten? But see, just in, in the same way that the Israelites were crying out, God, we, we were slaves here in Egypt. You promised to get us out of here, but, but we're waiting. And there was this season of generation comes and generation goes, and generation comes and generation goes. And then something happened. God sent a Savior. To the Israelites in Egypt, God sent a Savior named Moses to save them from the bondage of slavery and took them from that land to a land where they could be free. Through Mary, God would send the ultimate Savior, Jesus, whose name means salvation. And this was, he was the one that would ultimately save us from the bondage of sin and death. And see, the, the writers of the New Testament kind of understood this parallel between Moses and Jesus. In the book of Hebrews, the writer says it this way, Moses was certainly faithful in God's house as a servant, but his work was an illustration of the truths God would later reveal. Christ, as the Son, is in charge of God's entire house, and we are God's house if we keep our courage and remain confident in our hope in Christ. Now here's what can happen to us. We're going through, God has a promise for us. And we're, we're wondering, oh, God, when are you going to bring about the promise? We want you to work in us. We want you to work through us. We want you to work for us to bring about that desired outcome. And we're wondering and hoping, God, are you going to do it? And then there's a delay between the promise and the delivery of the promise. And it's like we start wondering, God, are you even hearing what's happening? Are you aware of what's going on? And see, the very same thing happened in Israel, and this is what God would tell Moses as they were, um, as he was going to, to rescue the people. He says this, Then the Lord told him, I have certainly seen the oppression of my people, Egypt. I have heard their cries of distress because of their harsh slave drivers. Yes, I am aware of their suffering. So I have come down to rescue them from the power of the Egyptians to lead them out of Egypt into their own fertile and spacious land. It is a land flowing with milk and honey. My friends, Christmas is a reminder that God never forgets promises that he's, made, that he's made to us. But it's also a reminder. It's also a reminder that God's hand cannot be forced. That his timetable cannot be pushed through our own demands. And sometimes we'll try to do that. We'll say, God, well, I want you to work, but I want you to work in, in my time. In my, in my time frame, in my timetable. And we're trying to make it happen, and all it does is make it worse. We're like my three-year-old son, Alexander. Um, you know, Xander uh, tries to do that with me. Uh, what Xander wants for Christmas is a remote control Lightning McQueen. That's what he wants for Christmas. Now, he already has a remote control Lightning McQueen, but as he tells me, Papi, that's a Cars 1 Lightning McQueen. It says Rusty's on the top. I need a light Cars 2 Lightning McQueen that has the piston cup on it. And so, and then it's kind of got more bells and whistles. And so that's what he wants for Christmas. Um, it's a really, it's a really cool toy. And we're really going to enjoy that as I play and he watches. Um, no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'll let him play with it sometimes. Um, no, but here's, now, now here's what he doesn't, here's what Xander doesn't know. What Xander doesn't know is that we've already got it for him. In fact, not only have we already gotten that for him, we've got him a bunch of other cars stuff that he hasn't even asked for. So, I mean, but he's getting it all on Christmas. And, uh, and, and, and the thing is, is that, but here's what he says to me. He says to me this the other day. He says, Papi, sit down. Okay, we're having our first sit down. So he sits me down, and he says, um, Papi, uh, I really want to get a remote control Lightning McQueen. 
And I say, okay, put it on your Christmas list. No, 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 no. Don't buy it for me on Christmas. Buy it now. And I say, no. And then he starts freaking out. And, I, and, 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 and he'll say, but I want it. And I say, Xander, I am happy to buy you many of the things that, uh, that you put on your Christmas list, but you will not be getting any of them today. But I want it. And he kind of goes through this whole thing. And, and listen, it doesn't matter. Now, the reality is this. He's going to get it and much more. I'm going to blow that kid's mind on Christmas Day because everything he's getting is cars related. He's even getting cars socks and cars underwear. All right? So everything that kid is getting is cars related. But none of it is coming. He's not getting any of it one minute before Christmas. And so, and, 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 and all he does is frustrate himself trying to get me to do something that I'm not going to do because it's not the timetable that I've set. And see, now, if that sounds familiar, you know, I think maybe you've done that. You know, yeah, we do that all the time with God, right? We negotiate, we reason, we try to force it, we try to make it happen in our own strength, and it's always a mess. And if we dig below the surface, here's the root cause. We either think God has forgotten us, or we think that God's not working fast enough. You see, do you know when you're going to meet your spouse? Right on time. You know um, when you're going to have kids? Right on time. You know, that was a hard one for me. That was a hard one for me because uh, my, it took my wife and I 10 years to have kids. And, I mean, people would say, like, people would try to, um, you know, in, in their kindness, try to get us to do other stuff. You know, like, you know, you should, you should set a date as to God's got to deliver by this date, and if he doesn't deliver by this date, then you're just going to go another route to have kids. And, you know, and I'd say, well, yeah, I'm probably not going to do that. And we went to the doctor to get ourselves checked out, you know, make sure things are working the way they're supposed to work. And, and we did. And I remember that we, we both did, got tested. And, and then the doctor says, he says, yeah, you guys are both healthy. I have no idea why you're not having kids. I'm like, wow, thank you very much for that. I'm um, glad you went to medical school for that diagnosis, buddy. Um, you know, uh, and, and so he, he, he tells us that. And here's the thing. Do you know when it happened? Right on time. It happened right on time. And you want to know the, you want to know the mind-blowing thing? Is that there's stuff that you're praying about, that I'm praying about, that we're praying about. There's things we're praying about, and you know when it's going to happen? Right on time. Do you know, are, are our prayers going to change it? No. Make it happen faster? No. Delay it? No. Change it in any way, shape, or form? No. Why pray then? Because we're supposed to. But it doesn't change it. Yeah, I know. Does it make sense? Nope. Is it frustrating? Yep. It's just the way it is. Because, listen, it's not about, you see, that's the, that's the problem that we have with praying. We think praying is about giving God our laundry list and then just watching the clock. Okay, God, I prayed. You got 20 minutes. Right? It's not, it's not about changing God. Listen, we pray about all this, and you know what happens? God ends up changing me. God ends up transforming me. And so the communion with him is not about me telling him what needs to happen. It's about me saying, God, this is my desire, but I'm opening myself up to you because I, you, I know that you know best. Now, that's the thing that's mind-blowing is that there are things that no matter how much we pray about it, what we do, um, nothing's going to change it. And this is what we call God's providential will. God's providential will is that there are things. This is the, this is the stuff that we get so frustrated about. There are things that God is going to do when he's decided to do it because he's God, and that's the end of it. And that frustrates us because we at least would like to be involved. God, I know you, you got your decision, but I would just like to bring into evidence exhibits A and B. I have a few things that I'd like to share because so they're pretty good. And then now once I lay this out, I'd like for us to have conference, and then we can really decide what the best course of action is. Now, and now look at this verse. It's on, it's on the second page of your notes. It's like the simplest verse, right? But check out what it says. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. That sounds like a simple statement, but it has enormous implications. Um, Jewish people throughout history have prayed for the Messiah to come. 
In fact, um, if you go into like a lot of Jewish prayers and all that, they would pray in the morning for God to send Messiah. They would pray in the evening for God to send Messiah the next day. And could you imagine when they found out God already had it set? It's like, man, we've been praying this hundreds of thousands of times throughout the ages for God to send the Messiah, and he had already picked the date? Yeah, it's his providential will. It's what he's decided to do at that particular time because for a million reasons, it was the right time. But all of the prayers, what they did was they didn't change God. They changed us as a nation to prepare us, to make us ready for the blessing of God sending his son because that's what, if we didn't pray all that time, we wouldn't have been changed for God to do what he said he was going to do. And that's why, listen, this whole thing begins where God has revealed his power that God wants to do a great work in us. But we got to realize and believe that God hasn't forgotten. It hasn't slipped his mind that God really is at work. And if he's really at work, we've just got to get in line with what he's doing. And so if God has revealed his power, look at the second half of the verse. It says that he's shown strength with his arm. The second thing is he has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. (coughs) He's scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Now let me tell you the second point of how do you know God's at work in your life. The second is that God has rooted his purpose. That there is a purpose that God has established in your life and in mine. There are purposes that God has established. And anything that's diverting that, God is going to scatter. You see, she, Mary sings that God scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts. Understand that these phrases are not randomly picked. These phrases are carefully selected. That term scatter is an emotionally charged term in the Hebrew culture. It refers to Jew- the Jewish people being scattered in 586 B.C. when King Nebuchadnezzar came in, wiped out Jerusalem, wiped out um, the, the southern kingdom of Judah, and just took all the people to Babylon for 70 years. And so the land was desolate. Israel was wiped out. And so there was this, this idea, the scattering w- was happening, and, and it's, it's an amazing thing. So the, the Greek word, which is diaspora, is a very emotional term in the Hebrew culture. When I was in New York, I drove through a, uh, I drove through a, a, a predominantly Jewish neighborhood um, in Brooklyn, and uh, realizing that this is, you know, um, it was only just recently that there are now more Jews living in Israel than there were living in New York City. And there's now more Jews living in Israel, but the, the second highest concentration of, of a, a, a Jewish population besides Israel is New York City. And I'm driving through, and this is what I'm thinking, this diaspora. This is the, this is the effect of the diaspora as God's, as, you know, Israel was scattered at, seven, at 70 AD when the temple was destroyed, and, uh, and they were all scattered throughout the entire earth. So when she sings the song and says, you know, that God has shown strength with his hand, with his, hand, with his arm, but he also scatters the proud. Whoa. Yeah, we know what it's like to be scattered. But he scatters the proud in the imagination of their hearts. You see, that term now, that has roots even further back than 586 B.C. That has its roots all the way back in the book of Genesis and in the Tower of Babel. I put it in your notes. Let me read this to you, the first few verses of Genesis 11. Here's what it says. It says, Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and dwelt there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and make, bake them thoroughly. And then uh, they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city, a tower whose top is in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language. And this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from over the face of the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. I want you to see three things in the verses that we read. Three things. Number one, he says this, 
um, let us build ourselves a city. There's three things that God wants to give us that this tower was supposed to replace. You see, when they say, let us build ourselves a city, they're looking for a purpose, right? So they've got this purpose, and then they say, let us make a name for ourselves. They're looking for identity. Lest we be scattered abroad, they're looking for security. And the reason why this is such a bad thing and God destroys it isn't because, well, you know, God doesn't like cities. No, it's not that. Last I checked in the book of Revelation, the New Jerusalem is a city. The problem is what this tower offers is a weak replacement for God's real purpose, real identity, and real security. And this tower, listen, this is so huge. This tower reaching to heaven, to the heavens, is the very beginning of religion. Religion, in its definition, is mankind trying to reach God. And that is why Christianity stands apart from any other faith system on planet Earth. Christianity is not mankind trying to reach God. Christianity is God coming down to reach men. That's what we celebrate at Christmas, is that God came down, was born in a manger, and the, ma the, the baby in the manger became the man on the cross, became the man in the tomb, the man who rose again, and the man who now offers life and peace and hope and forgiveness to all who would come to him. And see, there's a word play here, and I don't want you to miss it. Three times in the first four verses, the people say this, let us, let us, let us, let us build a tower. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad. And then in verse 7, God says, let us. Reference to the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit, conferencing together. And he says, you know what we need to do? We need to scatter them. Why scatter them? And, some, and we can actually look at this at the outset and say, what, what, why scatter them? Aren't they trying to do a good thing? They have a good project going. What, doesn't God want us to accomplish stuff? Yes. But not at the expense of you living less of a life. You see, whenever I set up a tower, whenever you set up a tower, an idol of our own accomplishments, we begin to kill the work that God wants to do in us, and we make ourselves a slave to those accomplishments. You see, that tower was their identity. It's who they were. It was what they associated themselves with. I mean, we are the, the people of the tower. We're the ones who have built the tower, and we're going to reach all the way to heaven with the tower. You ever met someone who th their entire identity is built on their profession? It's all about who they are. Well, you know, I'm Mr. So-and-so, and then you have your initials in, at the end. Well, you know, I do this for a living. And that becomes what, what they do. But then you ever meet someone that that's, their, their idol is, is, their whole identity is built on their profession and then they lose their job and they're no longer that? My friends, that's a tough thing. That's a tough thing because the thing that they have put their, all of their stock in is essentially an idol. And their idol is the thing that they found to give them the greatest meaning. It's what gave them purpose. It's what gave them identity. It's what gave them security. And when that tower comes crashing down, what happens? Well, what happens is, is that it's, it's, there's nothing worse than worshiping a God, an idol, who fails you. And when we decide to create an idol and we don't worship the true and living God, but we create something smaller, it's only a matter of time before that God fails us. And what most of us do is, is that, especially those of us that are Christians, is we say, well, you know, I worship God. And we give lip service to the idea that we worship God, but we really give all of our devotion to the idol that we've created. The problem is it never works out like that. It's never as clean, cleanly separated as we'd like it to be. And God loves us too much to let us live like that because the idol that we've created can never deliver in the way that our God can deliver. Uh, when I first moved into my, uh, when I moved into my first apartment, um, I was about 20, and uh, I, I had moved out on my own with a, with a friend of mine, and um, I, I was realizing something. See, when I lived at home, I grew up in kind of a typical Cuban home, uh, which is I didn't do anything for myself. Um, and so I had a Cuban mom that did everything for me. And so, like, what I would do is I would wear clothes, and then I would just throw them on the floor when I was done. And then through magic or however it worked, um, I, would come the, I would show up the next day, and all the clothes that were on the floor would be clean, ironed, and laying uh, folded on my bed. It was, like, it was like a laundry fairy had come. 
and had taken care of all of it. Well, I moved into my own apartment, and then I just threw the clothes on the floor like I always had. Apparently, the laundry fairy did not get the forwarded, forwarding address uh, thing that I had set up with the post office because I threw the stuff on the floor, and it was still on the floor. And then um, and I realized, like, you know, my, my mom would do all my laundry, and then I'm looking at my roommate, and I'm like, dude, let's get on the ball here. And, uh, and he's like, I'm not doing your stuff. And, uh, and I'm like, well, I, not only am I not doing it, I don't know how to do it. And so anyway, I called my wife, Carrie. We were just dating. We'd been dating for about a year, year and a half at the time. And so I called her, and I said, hey, I have a problem. And, and she said, what? And I said, I, I'm running out of clothes to wear, and all of it's dirty. And she said, well, why don't you, um, wh why don't you wash them? And I said, well, um, okay. Uh, I said, well, first of all, I don't know how. Secondly, I don't even know if I have a washing machine in this apartment. She's like, well, why don't you look around? And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it's not here. She's like, Bob, why don't you go out onto the patio you have and open up that utility closet that you have? So I open up the utility closet, and I say, I see these two big machines, but I'm not really sure what these items do. And, and, and anyway, this is, I, I wish I was making this up. I really do. And I said, okay, I think I found something. Can you come over and take care of it? And she's like, no, I'm not going to do that. And, uh, and I said, all right, so what do I do? And she said, well, then you take the clothes, you put it in, and then you got to measure it out. And I said, well, what do I put? She, all right. She's like, okay, let's go back. you got to go to Publix and buy the detergent and the soap. See, I'm not even really like that familiar with these terms. Um, uh, so she's like, you got to buy the, the soap, the detergent you put in, and then, you know, like fabric softener. Uh, I learned all about that that day. Like I had no idea, like that bouncy feeling, you know, was all about Downey. I had no idea. What an awesome invention. How did, we were living like animals before Downey. We were. Well, anyway, so I go and buy that stuff. But here's the thing, like, I'm trying to get this done. So I just take all the clothes that I had for about three weeks, crammed it all into this washer, because I'm thinking, like, I didn't, as long as the door closed, I thought I was good. And I just put the detergent in, and it, I figured they were dirty, so I'm like, I really put a good amount in there. And, uh, and then turned the thing on, and then I took out the clothes, and everything was pink. Just everything, because I didn't know. See, I didn't know about, like, and I call Carrie, and I'm like, hey, I, I, everything is, even my socks are pink. What happened? And she's like, what, you didn't separate? I'm like, separate what? I put all the clothes, I didn't put anything like metal. I just put clothes in there. And anyway, I didn't, you know, anyway, so I, I had no idea. Now, here's what happens. Now, here's why the thing turns pink, and it doesn't work out. Because things got mixed that should never be mixed. Now, this is what happens when I, lit, when I try to be a Christian, and I set up an idol. It creates a disastrous result because I'm trying to mix things that should never be mixed. And it never works out. You see, the tower was their identity. The tower was their purpose. It's the reason for their existence. And the tower was their security. It's the thing that made them feel safe. You know, if you go throughout this region, um, archaeologists have, th these things, that, these towers that they built are called ziggurats. And um, you can, you know, go on Wikipedia or something, you can see pictures of ziggurats. And they've found ziggurats like this all over that region. And the issue was that instead of trusting God, they found something less to trust in. And this is why the, the result of all of this was Babel. It was confusion. Because when I try to do it my own way, here's what I think it's going to bring. Clarity. Here's what it really breeds. Confusion. Could you imagine if, having been there that day? One guy's there. They're building this, this tower. And he says, hey, can you hand me a brick? And the guy looks at him and he says, wee oui, wee. Oui. And, uh, and they're like, no, dude, I need a brick. Parlez-vous, you know, And I was like, no, I don't, I don't parlez-vous. And uh, so he goes on to the other guy, and so he says, hey, can you hand me a brick? And the guy says, domo arigato. <laughs> oh, you know, thank you, Mr. Roboto. Uh, I don't, what are you talking, you know, he doesn't know that. And then it says to another guy, can you hand me a brick? No entiendo. And, uh, and so apparently that guy was Mexican uh, from what it sounded like. <laughs> <laughs> and so what happens is, is that people naturally group together. People naturally group together based on the languages they understood. So all the families that spoke German, they all grouped together. All the families that spoke French grouped together and, of course, had an attitude about it. And uh, 
All the families that, you know, that spoke Chinese, they all grouped together. All the families that spoke Spanish grouped together and then all moved to Miami. And, um, and so the whole idea is this, is that Mary's song reminds us. He's shown his arm to the strong, but here's the thing. He scatters the proud and the imagination of their hearts. He sh- Mary's song reminds us that even the greatest human ingenuity is nothing compared to the power and purposes of God in our lives. And we have to see that God is at work. And sometimes we think that what's happening is destruction. When really what it is is that God is taking something away so that he can begin to do a building work in our lives. And that's what brings it to the, um, the third point, which is in verse 52. He has put down the mighty from their th- thrones and exalted the lowly. And that's this last idea that God has raised up his people. Do you know why God opposes pride? Think about what happens. The Bible says this, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. It says this, that if you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, in due time he will lift you up. So the idea is, is that if I will actually be humble, understand who I am in light of who God is, that God will lift me up in due time. That is, make more of my life than I could possibly do. But here's what pride does. Pride does essentially the same thing, but in a completely different way. What, what pride does is that people try to make more of themselves by, by being proud, try to make themselves a big deal by being proud, when in actuality, your life is really less than that. When I humble myself, here's what God does. He actually makes my life more than it ever could be. And so the idea is, if I try to do that myself, God puts, puts me down. If I let God do it, he's the one that picks me up. And that's the thing that pride does. It robs us of everything that we can become. In the book of Daniel, there's this, um, this king named Nebuchadnezzar. And I mentioned him earlier. Nebuchadnezzar um, is filled with pride at all that he's created, the hanging gardens of Babylon and all the rest. And God lets him go literally crazy. I mean, certifiably, bring out the long white, you know, the, the white jacket with the long sleeves. Uh, this guy is just nuts. And um, God lets him go crazy for a time. And then he comes, he comes to his senses and has this tremendous insight. Let me read it to you. This is what he says at the end of this season. He says, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven and my understanding returned to me. And I blessed the Most High and praised and honored him who lives forever, for his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he does according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can restrain his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time, my reason returned to me, and for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and splendor returned to me. My counselors and nobles uh, resorted to me, and I was restored to my kingdom. An excellent excellent majesty was added to me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all of whose works are truth, and in his ways, justice. And those who walk in pride, he is able to put down. When this guy, when pride takes over his life, He's turned into an animal and goes crazy. When, he, when it's over, he realizes that no one can be proud because everything comes from God. And that's the very thing that happens. And so what, what does this mean now for us? It means this. It, it, it's in, the, in the book of Micah, it says, He has shown you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But that you do justly, that you love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Now, how does that work out practically? What, how it works out practically in our lives, let me, let me tell you how it works practically um, in relationships, in, in marriage. People are miserable in marriage because of pride many times. I mean, it, you, it's not you that's wrong. It's them. It's always them. You've been married six times, and every time, it's always them. Right? And, it, it's, like, and you have these, it's like, well, who's the common denominator? You know, you just can't find a good woman anymore. Uh, and it's like, well, I'm guessing you probably found five or six. Um, but there's a common denominator, a common problem. And, it, well, that would be me, and it can't be me. So who could it be? You know, and listen, here's what humility does. Recognizes our own weaknesses and takes responsibility. Humility says, I'm not perfect. I need to grow. I need God's help. Listen, a lot of couples, they won't go to counseling. You know why? Because of pride. Well, you know, we handle our problems in-house. 
Okay, but what if there's a problem you got that you can't handle in-house? You gotta actually bring somebody in that loves Jesus and, and wants to help you. Well, I don't know if I could do that because, and, and why? Because you might find out you're wrong. You might find out that, well, I'm just doing it the way my parents told me. I just, I'm doing it the way my parents did. How's their marriage? Ah, they're divorced, they hate each other. Okay, yeah. Just, all right, you may wanna think of a different strategy. And sometimes there's this stuff and we, do, and we don't even realize what we're doing. Do you need, you need, oh man, I need help with my kids. Oh, all right, well, what do you do? I'm doing what my parents did. How'd it work out for them? Oh man, I'm all messed up. Okay, you may wanna think through a different plan. Um, but sometimes we won't let somebody else help us and all it is is pride. You know, um, singles, you know, you know why sometimes we get to the same point in every relationship, and here's what we do. We self-destruct a relationship at the same place over and over again. And we won't come to the realization that what we need is help. And it's, that it's pride that's continually just destroying these relationships over and over. Careers don't get advanced because of pride. Because we think we know everything. Instead of asking questions, humbling ourselves, and then going forward. You know why some of us don't grow in our relationship with God? It's because of pride. We aren't growing, and a lot of times it's because we will not submit to God and do what he's asking us to do and realizing that he knows best. And if we would just say, God, I realize that you know best, and I'm humbling myself to that fact that I do not have all the answers, that's when growth, be when growth happens. When we say, God, I trust you, and I'm going to follow wherever you lead. And listen, for some of us, we, we've never even, what's kept us from God is pride. We, we think like, well, come on, I mean, I got to admit that I need God. Yeah, you got to admit that you need God because everybody needs him. But doesn't that make me weak? No, it makes you something else. It makes you human because we need him. And I want to give you an opportunity to come to him. Let's pray together.